everybody, and welcome to this next episode of the I Hate Matt Wall podcast, where today we're going to get into the nitty gritty of the what is your poetry with Mr. Matthew Buckley Smith. I haven't finished editing the episode yet, so I don't know if this is going to be the full thing or if it's not going to be. I'm going to try to make it the full thing, but we'll see. We will see. Um, But first, I want to do those motherfucking shout outs here on the fucking podcast. But we've had so many new fucking swinging dicks come in here that I'm going to have to look and just make sure I don't forget anybody because this is absolutely fucking bonkers. How amazing you fucking guys are. How much you guys fucking give a shit. I fucking love it. So first off, let's give a big fucking thank you to those motherfuckers over on Patreon. I would like to give a thanks to Michael, to Deborah, to Cedar, to Harry. Thank you guys so much for being over there. If you guys are listening to this, I wish you'd come over to YouTube. That would be cool because it would honestly be a lot better. Even though the cuts are better over on Patreon, I would be able to offer you more if you came over to this neck of the woods over here on the tubes. So thank you for that. And then, because there was a bunch of confusion, I had people trying to sign up for the Anarchy crew, but being confused as to if the crew was different than the Anarchy crew and the whole thing. So to make it a little bit easier, I changed the name of the crew to the Thank You crew. So, like, the starter tier, where you don't get the Poetic Anarchy course or anything like that, but you are helping me out a little bit, and I fucking appreciate that. And because of that, I give you a little something extra every week. So I appreciate it. So let's give the big thanks over there to Patrick, to AM, to Alan, and also to Britt and JH. You guys are fucking awesome. Thank you guys so much. And thank you for you new members to the thank you fucking crew. Fucking appreciate it. And then let's get into the big swinging fucking dicks over at the fucking Anarchy Crew. So I want to give a big thank you to, to Bunny, to Mindy, to Nate, to Thomas, to Tim, to Lisa, to Josh, to Jessica, to Shaylin, to Caitlin. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Glad to have you on board. And a big motherfucking thank you to the number one chappy, the SDG. Thank you so much. You guys are fucking awesome. And you guys are the reason why I'm able to sit here and run this liquor. So thank you. And I appreciate what you do. And I hope I'm giving back as much as I'm getting in return. Because you guys are fucking amazing. So, with that said, it's time for some brass tack shit here, guys. You know what time it is? Yeah, that's what time it is. It's five stars of fucking clock. So that means run your asses over to iTunes. Because I'm assuming that's where you're listening to this. And give this motherfucker five stars. I swear to God, the plumber just rolled up. And if they fucking turn the water off here again, I'm going to fucking start screaming. These fucking people. Turning the water off like two or three times a week for hours at a time. No notice. It's driving me crazy. Uh, Anywho. So, there is that. Oh, you guys want a writing prompt? I'll give you a fucking writing prompt right now. Here is your writing prompt. When I say this word, I want you to write the poem that first comes to mind. When I say the word podcast. Write that fucking poem. And write it hard. Um, I don't know if I talked about this on the last episode, but I'll fucking mention it again here. For those of you wondering, I have a 
four-part little video series. There's actually more parts to it. I have a playlist on my YouTube channel called Filmmaking 101. But this week, I'm doing this little thing where um, I'm going over these kind of misconceptions and also things that people have heard numerous times, but they don't fucking put it into effect. They, they don't fucking do it. They, they, they know it, but they don't fucking do it. And the first video went up today as of recording this, and that video is called Write What You Know. And on Wednesday, there will be uh, the next video, and that will be, um, wh what is it? Uh, I can't remember which one's next. I'll, I'll just give you the spiel right now. The things are, and these are like my fucking, like, my tenants, I guess you could say, my commandments, when it came to me making low-budget movies, okay, writing the scripts, producing the movies, directing the films, the whole fucking thing. Write what you know, write where you live, write what you have, and write who you know. If you do those four things, you can fucking do, you, you could be working Every fucking day of the week for now until eternity, if you want. Okay? Making fucking movies. Like, that's as easy as it is. Now, to understand what those things actually mean and how you actually put those things into practice, you have to fucking go to my YouTube channel and um, click the Filmmaking 101 playlist or just look for those videos. And it'll say Filmmaking 101 at the beginning of each one. Um, also... This week is the uh, 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 premiere of my new chapbook, MacArthur Park. And this is basically like a sequel to my chapbook, Los Angeles, that did wonderfully. So this is more poems about um, the unhoused community right around here where I live. Um, and this is in includes the 12-part poem, snapshots from macarthur park um so definitely pick this up it's really fucking good i fucking love it um that's over at my etsy shop and if you can't find any of this stuff if you don't know how to just look into the fucking show notes or anything like that just go to i hate mattwall.com click the youtube button click the etsy button click the patreon button there's little fucking buttons you can fucking click them and they take you fucking places you want to know why because i am a good fucking host and I like taking my friends out. Okay? There it is. There it is. All right. And then Poetic Anarchy. Um, we're doing a special little Christmas thing that I don't know if all of the Anarchy crew knows about yet. I posted the video today. Um, I haven't checked to see how many views or any comments or anything like that yet. But we will see. We will see. We will see. We will see. So, without any further uh-ohs. Let's get into the fucking shit with the what's your poetry tag and the person who I tagged and then screamed you're it, Matthew Buckley Smith. Okay, so let's let's jump into that shit since we kind of dove mm -hmm. into it already. So, um, metaphor yeah. simile. What do you what do you dig? I'm gonna piss you off. <laughs> You're not going to piss me off. It's fine. I have I have always been super irritated by this distinction. Um, like I, I remember learning about it in school. Everybody, you know, if you learn like one thing about uh, mm -hmm. poetry, it's a metaphor is a comparison between two unlike things, and a simile is a is a is a comparison uh, explicitly using like or as. Um, like I was thinking about like my 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 favorite three Shakespeare sonnets, and they all three use this sort of like weird hybrid thing that's like definitely an explicit comparison, but doesn't use like or as. That time of year that mazed me behold when yellow leaves are none of you do change like uh, do hang. So like he's saying, when you look at me, you will. Uh, see you may see autumn when all these things happen like that's as yeah. explicit he's not saying i am autumn he's not saying my my hair you know f flickers you know like the leaves on the tree he but it's an but explicit he is kind of he's saying no, it's, no, it's, like, with, it's an explicit it's, yeah it's an explicit comparison 
but it's not, it doesn't use like or as like it would, I think it would be it would be false to say that's a that's a uh -huh. non simile in the same way that when he says shall I compare thee to a summer's day like that's you basically because the answer to that question is like no right uh, in, in um, uh, 116 he says love's not time's fool right just like well that's a that's a, it's explicit but it's also a, it's it's not a metaphor I mean I think so I think that the thing with similes is we use this distinction no. between metaphor and simile because it's easily phrased it's easily put mm -hmm. and it's easily taught in class I think and metaphor categories. is a big umbrella category M metaphor mm -hmm. is the big category within metaphor, simile, you have simile falls you, have, in. yeah. you have metonymy you have synecdoche you have allegory uh, you have symbolism, right? Those are all sub varieties of metaphor. It's not yeah. metaphor versus simile. That just seems like a bizarre dichotomy. Yeah. So that's my, my, that's my rant. My, my argument on this. Okay. Well, let me ask. Well, no, let me do my argument first. My argument is, is that, um, and if you watch that video, you probably heard it already, but like when you place it in those terms, it's easy mm -hmm. for everyone to understand. And when a poet goes metaphor crazy and just starts metaphor after metaphor after metaphor after metaphor, there comes a point, and I don't know if this is a new writer thing or like a baby writer thing, where the metaphors start compounding upon each other so much that you don't even know what the fuck they're talking about in the first place to get to the metaphor yeah. that they got to. That's my biggest problem. Right. And when and when you do well, things like, like bad, say like, like or bad as bad metaphor. Sure. Yeah, yeah, but but bad metaphor doesn't start as bad metaphor in that sense. Like you can use a metaphor it's and have it be fine. Like... But if you start stacking yeah, metaphors, don't... then you start fucking going crazy. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. I know you've read stuff yeah, like yeah. this. So it's like Oh, totally, totally. Yeah. yeah. But I also like I... I mean, I guess like my answer is like, I like good metaphors <laughs> like good, and like good similes because I mean, there are also similes that go crazy. Like home, I mean, Homer similes go bananas. Like they like he'll have an epic simile that lasts like half a page. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, and like, it's only at the end he says, just so did a, did Achilles sword cut through the crane. Like just so Jesus, I was like, I was in fucking, you know, like uh, uh, Thessaly for like 15 minutes there. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, but I, I think, like mixed metaphors drive me crazy. I also like, there's a thing that I, I feel like a lot of, I feel like there was like, was it Adrian Rich who would do this where she would use a colon and then later in the same sentence, there'd be another colon and then another colon. And I kept thinking it was like the nesting dolls where it was like, how many, where, where are we anymore? Yeah. And so like, yeah, they're definitely metaphors that like, <laughs> that just keep adding, adding, like you put, you know, you, you stack more and more and more uh, up and no, I mean, that's, that doesn't, that's not good for anybody, but that's not so, a problem with metaphor. That's just a problem with bad writing. Okay. So then with that being said, that's what you don't like. Now, what makes a bad metaphor writing? something? Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> what makes a metaphor something you like? Oh, the ring of truth. When you compare something and it feels, I mean, that's, I think the Car Carmine's phrase was the brilliant accuracy, mm -hmm. you know, like re reading, reading a, poem and hearing something articulated just so in a way that uh was the the line that jonathan likes to quote of popes he says um what oft was thought but ne'er so well expressed doesn't metaphor when it becomes clear like that that's actually a slightly different category but yeah sorry go ahead um wouldn't that be a cliche at that point if it's so brilliantly like pop it becomes a cliche quickly i mean i think that that's you know donald hall has an essay it's sort of a heavy-handed essay but he, he talks about there are different stages for metaphor there's mm -hmm. a metaphor that's fresh that, that it still it still uh startles us with its revelation and yeah. that's that's what we enjoy in poetry and then there's a metaphor that's so old that it is just part of the language because fundamentally all of the language is figurative like you, yeah. it's very hard to dig down. I remember there was a thing that came out. It was like an article when I was in grad school about these these like nine fundamental words that they could trace back through all like Indo-European, where they think like these were like some of the very first words that we ever had. And some of those have um, we've held on to today. I remember two of them were bark and spit, that these were like, those mean exactly what they say and nothing else. But almost every other word is a metaphor for something. 
And so like when a word, when a metaphor is that old and just fossilized and it becomes part of the language, then that's, yeah. that's just language. But there's this middle territory where we, it's still, it still feels like a metaphor, but it doesn't have any juice left. It's just, yeah. it's like, like flavorless gum. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff that, that newscasters use say all the time. I mean, even, even like jokes that, that aren't jokes anymore, like, it's deja vu all over again. Like deja vu all over again was a funny joke when uh, what's his name said it, um, Yogi Berra. But like it's it's now it's just a thing that people repeat in order to have something to fill the end of the 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 uh, phrase or fill the end. Yeah. Of the sentence. What do you think about this? Like, do you think? And I don't know if I talked about this before, but I feel like a metaphor has a bigger punch in a poem that doesn't have any metaphor in it until the one metaphor. Do you think a uh, average metaphor could carry more weight in a poem that that's the only one it has? Uh, it can. I, I think I think you can certainly step on your own toes, uh, and that's actually what Donald Hall talked. I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the essay because it's actually a smart point that, that part of he's talking about dead metaphors, but he also talks about mixed metaphors and um uh like it, it, he talks about the um the problem with saying something like he cradled the ak-47 in his arms uh, mm -hmm. because the cradle is still a, like that's still it's not a fresh metaphor but neither is it one that's completely integrated into the language and so instead it gives us the image of a gun as a baby well yeah um, if it wanted to be a fresh <laughs> metaphor it would be ar-15 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, right, yeah. Uh yeah. That's that's it would be that would be more current. Uh but I, I yeah, sure. They're, like I think as with the second person, I mean that that's a trick that's been done so many times that it's gotten stale. Like Elizabeth Bishop does it, I think, quite nicely in Insomnia, but the the turn at the very end of the poem to you, when the you has not been mentioned until the very end. I think that can you know yeah. there are plenty of different things you can save up till the end and then get a big kick out of, but yeah, I don't know. I, I so I wrote a poem that people liked a few years ago called "Poem Without Metaphors," and and then of course I realized like there were metaphors in it. Like there's like inescapably you can't not have metaphors in a poem, you know, just because you use made of language. But uh, but then like I read it at a reading, and then I started to feel sort of ill because I realized like I don't have metaphors in most of my po like most of my poems are without metaphors. Like God damn it! Like what? What? Because uh, I think I I. I wonder about that. I wonder about, yeah, I mean, I, I, metaphors, I don't know that I am, like, I'm not a natural rhymer. I'm not a natural m metaphor, metaphortician, metaphor, I don't know, metaphor, uh, metaphorist. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, like, that's something I worry about, right? Because that's what, like, that's, that's, the, that's supposed to be the essential quality of the poet, right? Is the ability to, to make metaphor. Uh, and I don't well, know. Well, to make it understandable. Nice. Yeah. Well, like to, understandable to metaphor. make the connection and then yeah. convey the connection. You need both. Uh, and I don't, I don't know. I think it's still pretty mysterious to me. All right. So this next bullshit, um, what is the most important element in a poem for you? Like, what do you look for in a poem? First it's voice. I have to feel like I'm listening to a human being talk, even mm -hmm. if it's a, even if it's a theatrical human being, even if it's, in a an otherworldly register it, you know like i have to believe that this is a not even a human being it could be an angel it could be a god it could, you know but I, it has to be a voice that i find credible uh and then not necessarily you know what people use the terrible word relatable it doesn't need to be out of my i just need to hear a thinking being speaking and yeah. and if i if i can't lock hold of that then i'm really i can't get anywhere with the poem uh, but I, yeah, then, then I do tend to want some kind of argument and some care with the language, but I think, yeah, voice has got to be for, if voice is not there, then it's then game over. Yeah, for real. Yeah. That's actually, that's really cool. Cause like, I've always been a thing, like a big feeling guy, like there's gotta be mm -hmm. feeling in it. Oh yeah, yeah definitely. But, definitely. but like when you talk about voice though, like that's true because I'm sure every poem out there has feeling in it because motherfuckers wrote it and they felt whatever the fuck they felt when they wrote it. Some, but if they're... <laughs> some, some poems really don't have feeling, but yeah. Uh, I mean, I think like by design, like some people, some poets sneer at that notion. Yeah. Uh, and I find those poems uh, totally tiresome, but I think yeah, 
feeling tends to be like two or three steps in and I've got like, I, I, and you need, I, I, I have to have it, right. It is necessary. Yeah. But, it, but, like, but you can't have that without voice. Right. Voice has to come first. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly there. <laughs> so what is your um, favorite school or movement in poetry? Yeah. I was thinking about this. I, I am also kind of baffled by schools and movements. And I mean, I do think they're basically a critical phenomenon. Like there are precious few writers, thinkers, artists who would claim a like because it's Sartre something that claimed, you're given. Yeah, it's something that's know? it's it's a it's a term that's used to describe a group from the outside. I mean, there are sometimes people who really claim like the guy who invented Dada. I think he meant to invent Dada. Okay. Tristan, but wasn't um, the whole idea of creating it to be like a joke against like um, modernism and shit or surrealism? Which one was um, before the other? Yeah, Tristan Zara. Yeah, oh, no, I mean, I think like, I guess my point is like there are artists and thinkers who have claimed a school or a movement. Sartre did that with yeah. existentialism. Zara did that with Dadaism. Uh, uh, I think Mondrian did with De Stijl. I'm not sure. But I, I think mostly it's a critical phenomenon. And I was also thinking like most movements or schools, there's like a headliner. And then sometimes there's like way down, there's like a second billing name. And then mm -hmm. like, it was like the Auden group was like Auden, Louis McNeese, C. Day Lewis. Like that's it. So like, I feel like movements are often just like a guy, and then like some other people who are around him. So I, I don't know. I was actually recently uh, included in a movement that I have. I'm totally ambivalent about. I, I, brilliant. It's actually like a brilliant guy, a critic named uh, Brian Bridger, who is. Who I'm going to try to get on the show. He's like very, very smart, very sweet guy, but he picked up this term, expansive poets, expansive poetry that had, was invented in the '80s. I think it's sort of a terrible term and it doesn't, it doesn't convey or express anything, but he, he has tried to revive that as a kind of a replacement for new formalism. Um, and as well as the like not formal, but narrative poems. And he's, he's tried, sort of tried to make a, make an argument for this being an ongoing movement. Uh, and I got, I, I was, I was, I, I, I was a name named of about, about which I feel, uh uneasy <laughs> at best but yeah, so just, is I, it I, is it gonna to be see, yeah. is it gonna be a new wait what was what did he expansiveness what did he call it no i mean it's expansive but i think all that means yeah, yeah. is that back when back when people were first doing new formalism it it was really unheard of to write in form and so they were saying we want poetry to be expansive and to include free verse as well as form as well as narrative whatever you know again i yeah. think it's not a good label and it doesn't really it doesn't really capture anything but i also like even if it were a good label that like sounded cool i would be uneasy about it because i don't like what is the good of movements what does that mean it means that someone can find you on wikipedia when they're looking up movements uh well the question i wanted to ask in response to this question which is far more interesting to me is what movement would if somebody if somebody decided to uh write your wikipedia page and, and include this entry what movement would you be a part of like what would characterize the movement of which you would you would be a member i honestly think it would probably be meat poetry but i don't even think i fall into that category because that was like a meat, big like poetry yeah that was like a late like... 60s 70s thing where um like everything like you know how you were talking about um fuck how did you say it oh everything um has stakes almost like there's risk or whatever in the poetry yeah 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 like everything has to fucking mean something and it has to be fucking like on the page and all this shit. But the problem I have with it is because of when it came around, there is this um, weird masculinity placed on it. Oh, and yeah. 
to me that anyone who has to put masculinity onto something they're a part of means that they are afraid or ashamed or worried about their own masculinity. So that would be the one thing that I don't dig about it. But most of the poetry that I like comes out of that school. If you even call it a school. And this is M M E A T. Yeah. Like there has to be okay. a lot of meat on the bone kind of right, thing. Right. I see. I see. But me, um, and specifically meat meaning true to life kitchen sink detail that is grounded in reality. I mean, what is. I guess so. But at the same time, one of like my favorite um, meat poets is this dude named Steve Richmond who um, thought he was being, I guess, haunted by demons. And he could see the demons all the time. And the demons were the things that made him write. And so he would just write all of these poems about the demons that were in his house making him write. And this went on for like 40 fucking years. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, he wasn't the most grounded individual, <clears throat> but like his shit's fucking nuts. And like, I know when I read his stuff, he feels that this stuff is fucking real kitchen sink fucking shit, you know? Yeah, yeah. So as long as he feels that way, it comes across that way. Right. No, I mean, I, I think that makes sense. And, and again, like that's true for, or so many movements where like in order to in order to like wedge different members into the group you have to make all these exceptions and it, like again it's why it's, mm -hmm. it's why movements are sort of meaningless i asked actually at the alcw conference there was a guy who did a paper on movements uh on so some specific movement the what was he oh what was the um it was the deep was it the deep image poets? I can't remember. It may not have been, but he, but I, I, I raised my hand. And I, my question was, are movements real? Uh, and his answer was not really. Uh, so I think like, I think, I think, yeah, it's a, it's a critical phenomenon, but I think like, yeah, like that you both recognize the, that you like admire other people in this group that you recognize it's a label that could easily be applied to you and that you feel uneasy about it. All of that confirms to me that yes, you would be called a meat poet. Oh, because like because you're not a real member of a of like a movement if you don't if you don't like uh, uh bristle at being called a member of that group yeah no i could see that because a lot of this like i am a huge like nerd when it comes to the history of american publishing like mm. i get off finding out like when certain publishing companies started, when certain magazines were created, how they were created, when um, the mimeograph revolution started. And there's this huge blind spot in literature or historical facts about literature about the mimeograph revolution because it happened so fast and it exploded so quickly. And most magazines only lasted like two or three issues. And so... Yeah they like died and so a lot of people didn't even realize that they should be documenting all the shit that was going on and during that period there were tons of people who would end up being huge writers or were huge writers even at the time who were submitting to these things because they were just other magazines to submit to even though they were like shitty little fucking zines right you know what i'm saying when, and so when, a lot of when when was this period um, this was, I would say probably like 58, 59, but it didn't okay. become, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Inexpensive enough for everyone until probably right. like in between 68 and 70. And then okay. that it lasted until Xerox. And then when the photocopy machine came out, the mimeograph died, but yeah. So just shit like that. So. Well, I'm curious because you and you've even talked about like your you gr you've grumbled about paper quality and you sent me you sent me some books of like varying like publication quality, including just like your you do your your it's not even a broadsheet. It's like a small sheet um, that's mm -hmm. blood rag. Uh, yeah. So I'm curious, given given your enthusiasm for uh, for like SO 
esoterica and ephemera having to do with like zines and, and little little magazines, little publications. What do you imagine? How do you think about your own output 50 years from now? Well, I hope there's a shit ton of it and that there's <laughs> I mean, enough think, of it. Yeah, I think... <laughs> There's, yeah, <laughs> there's... <laughs> quantity is probably not the question yeah no like um the thing that's awesome about the newsprint is that like i use the newsprint specifically because it will deteriorate faster than normal paper so it's like i want it to be like used and abused right now but i want there to come a point when someone's like oh shit i should like put this in something so it doesn't get fucked up you know what i'm saying and so that's kind of like the because the only way it will last is if people like keep it and keep it good you know what i'm saying like yeah, yeah. i could make a million the real, fucking the real preservative is like personal care like yeah somebody, but the only reason why care about your poem yeah and even no, okay this this is yeah. this is so silly here but like not even care about the poem but just realize that oh this paper's fragile i better do something with this and then maybe 50 years from then someone might read it and go oh this ain't bad you know what i'm saying like i just need someone to give a yeah, shit yeah, about yeah. the paper <laughs> it's like it's like leaving a baby on a on a firehouse uh stoop like yeah. because it's a baby they have like they can't you know if you, if you exactly if you left like uh, yeah Right. If it was like if lost like a box, it'd be like, yeah, yeah. like oh, so this thing will be fine. We'll check on that tomorrow. We'll see what's going on. But like, it's be like, oh, we got to do something with this baby right now. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that seems fair. I mean, you you do have like a big um, one man's trash is another man's treasure kind of philosophy. I I hope you're right. I tend to I tend to believe it moves much more often in the other direction, and that just like one man's trash is another man's trash more often than not. Yeah. Uh, well, that's why there's like 50 copies and then hopefully there'll be 10 left, you know, like right. 40 people could say this is trash and throw it in the trash. But as long as there's a handful of people that like hang on to it, then that's, that's man, the plus if you, side. If you got a, if you got a 20% hit rate with your poems, that's astounding. That's like, um, Oh, I was going to tell you, cause you brought it up on the show. The, um, distribution for blood rag i usually make um 50 copies to give to the authors who are in it okay. the different poets yeah, yeah, yeah. and then i print out another 50 copies and i'll sell sure. those and then sometimes i'll give them out like if i'm out and about and i put them up places yeah, and yeah, shit. Yeah. sure and so uh, the, every original run is about 100 but okay. i i'm out of issue two and i'm out of issue three Issue one, I had to make another 50 of. So, and I probably will make another 50 of two and three. Okay. But um, I don't know. So that's kind of what the um, the rate of it is. But on the next one, I'm going to put a little thing on the bottom because I was reading this book um, about the broadside culture of the 60s. That's mm. really, the information's really good, but the guy writing it is such a fucking jackass that it makes me want to fucking kill yeah, him yeah, every yeah. time I read it. But on one of the broadsides that they were talking about on there, they had this thing that said, um, make as many copies of this as you can and pass them out. Like it said mm, it on, yeah, yeah. and I'm like, oh, that's a good thing. I should do that. So I'm going to start doing that. Cause I've yeah. always told like the poets who submit, like, I'm going to send you some, do whatever you want with them, make copies, you know, do whatever the fuck you want. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, hopefully I could get people um, actually print more out and put them out places and stuff. That's the goal. Yeah, anyway. I know. That, that all, that all makes sense to me. And I, I mean, I, I don't publish that often, but like, I feel this way about really everything that I put out. It just is like, I'll get a contributor's copy in the mail. And then I think, you know, the first thing I do is I look at the table of contents and then, and then I'll see if I know a couple names on there, then I think like, well, maybe they will take a look at it. And other than that, I kind of assume nobody's going to read it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I'm very open-minded about ways to get people to read poetry. So I'm glad to, to participate in, in, you know, your, your version of the experiment. Yeah, dude, I, it, I'm excited. It's been going well. 
All right, all right, guys. You you know how it goes. I fucking pussed out. I pussed out. I can't fucking say it any other way than that. I got too scared of the file size and had to fucking pull back. I don't always pull out, but when I do, there's a reason. I, I'm sorry you're not getting the full fucking episode now. But you know what? This means you'll just have to come back on Saturday and fucking hear the rest of what Buck's got to fucking say. You know what I'm saying? So, with that said, make sure you do the thing. Go to my YouTube page. Click the join button. When that button gets clicked, you will see three different tiers. You will see the thank you crew. You will see the anarchy crew. And you will see chapbook of the month. Okay? Now here's the deal. Chapbook of the month, again, gets everything the anarchy crew gets. But you also get whatever I put out that month. You know what I'm saying? And let me fucking make this deal a little bit sweeter. You will always get the lowest number on the numbered things. So, for instance, SDG is getting MacArthur Park. And when MacArthur Park gets to SDG, when they open it, it's going to have my name all signed right here. And then next to it, it's going to say one out of 37. You get the lowest numbers. You get the numbers before they go on sale, if that makes sense. Do you guys see what I'm saying? You get special fucking treatment. This is nepotism at its fucking finest. And as you were hearing right there at the end of that episode, we were also hearing about the blood rag. Blood rag issue six is almost done. I'm putting the final touches on it and that should be out at the end of the week. And I'm fucking excited. Are you excited? You should be. There's a lot of cool shit in there, including bucks, including bucks, including me. And there are some other people in there, too. There's going to be something from Ethan. If you remember the email I got last time, the triumphant fucking return of poor Al. I'll tell you all about that next time. Got something from B.L. Kohler. Got something from Mark Rennie. This issue is shaping up to be quite a huge fucking deal, people. And they're only a dollar. And when you get them, I encourage you to make as many copies as you want and fucking duct tape them to whatever fucking police car you see. Just all over town, okay? All over town. So now, let me get deep with those motherfucking butt plugs because to be honest i already did a bunch of them right now but again if you want the um 2021 yearbook of my poetry and short stories you gotta fucking go and sign up for my mailing list because once december is done that book is gonzo you will never see it again okay so you gotta fucking do that if you want to do the mentorship thing, you don't want to do the monthly thing or whatever like that. You just want like a one-on-one -on -one with me for an hour where I help you put your shit together, lay out your fucking business strategy, lay out a plan so you can have a successful fucking run. Whether it's poetry, novels, short stories, filmmaking, or music, I can fucking help. And if I can't, I'll tell you I can't, and I won't take your fucking money. But if I can help, I'm going to take that money, I'm going to put it deep in my pocket, or pay a bill with it immediately, because something's probably late. Again, chapbooks, blood rag, zines, those are up. Broadsides, those are up on my Etsy shop. My books, like my novels and shit, and a couple poetry collections are up on my Amazon store, including Poetic Anarchy Anthologies. Volume three, coming sooner than you think. Let's see, again, my music can be found anywhere. My art, if you go to my Instagram and look at my artsy shit, hit me up if you want some originals. If you want prints, those are coming. Um, and if you have any comments, if you don't like something that I fucking said, what's going on with my hair? Jesus Christ, I did a fucking spring cleaning yesterday in December and um, 
my hair got so fucked. I don't know what happened. I think I had bleach on my hands and I kept like running my fingers through my hair. And now my hair looks just fucking ridiculous. And the only way you'd be able to see that is if you were at least in the thank you crew to be able to see this fucking mop. Actually, it looks pretty good. It looks like um, my hair looks like Morrissey just woke up. That's what my hair looks like right now. And I'm also wearing a cod piece. But you wouldn't know that if you're just listening. So, you know, what are you going to fucking do? But yeah, if you have any hate mail or love letters or anything like that, just send them to IHateMattWalt at gmail.com and I will fucking read them on the show. I had some emails and comments to read on this show and I forgot and now we're almost done. So um, I got to fucking wrap this motherfucker up like a goddamn Caesar wrap. I said wrap too many times. So that kind of fell flat. But you know how it is. So run over to Etsy, pick up MacArthur Park. Next time we talk, Blood Rag Issue 6 will be out, and I'll tell you to fucking pick that up too. But what's more important than anything, what am I going to fucking tell you to do? What the fuck am I going to tell you to do? I'm going to say, ass in chair, hands on keyboard, and type motherfucking hard. And I will see you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.